day and Tuesday means more any new Tensura content. This one is called the Time Rimuru Became an Adventure. In that time, I forgot oh, Tensura. This is stuff that apparently happened chronologically right before uh, the video that we watched last time, which was How Strong is Rimuru Tem Tempest, so part three. So we're going to do this adventure one, and then we're going to watch How Rimuru Became a Demon Lord, and then go on from there. Okay, guys, here we go. Some of you may not know this, but there was actually a time back in season one when Rimuru had officially become an adventurer. He had traveled all the way to the kingdom of Blumund, registered with the free guild as a monster. Blumund? Brumund. It doesn't matter. Monster Slayer type adventurer, then immediately shocked everyone by completely acing the ranking test. Is this OVA? This is before the teacher arc, so it's still season one, but before we get to meet the kids. As in, we're wasting more time without realizing the kids could be dying pretty soon. Isn't that mind boggling to you? That Rimuru spent all that time. Fucking around, just stalling, while these kids of Shizu's, they could be dying at any moment. I know that they have some kind of sensitive timeline, but it's just funny to imagine. Like, he went on all these different things before going to the kids finally. He was like, oh shit, y'all gonna die? Here's some powers to fix you up. Now, if you're wondering why you don't remember any of this, well, that's because it never happened in the anime. This entire arc in which Rimuru starts to discover how these human kingdoms operate was completely bypassed at the tail end of season one. Why? It's a pretty massive portion of cut content that not only explains the fundamentals of the guild and adventurers, but also shows how Rimuru learned a couple new Damn. abilities that were essential to the next arc. Summoning, I think. I forget. We covered this shit like last uh, Tensuro and news content, and he said something about being the adventure quest. There was like an important thing. So let's take a look at what exactly Fuck you, happened Yuki. during Rimuru's journey to becoming an adventurer. But first, but first, oh! this video is sponsored by Raycon. <sighs> I'm undefeated, bro. It doesn't matter if it's an anime opening, if it's a fucking anime. I got it fucking unlocked. You just know. But first, before we get started, you guys know what to do. Use your fucking anime discount to get some Raycons. All right, back to the main content. Back to the video. Yeah. We I start call that out too. Only a few days after Rimuru had returned from the armed nation of Dworkin. Though these were events that happened a few episodes into Season 2 Part 1, where they actually took place was before Rimuru had even found Shizue's students. They're dying right so now! This whole mini-arc actually occurs in a weird space between the events of Season 1 and Season 2. As we know... The light novel covers are so good. The art is so fucking different. Sorry, is this manga? I think this is manga. Manga art, bro. So different. I mean, same with Mushoku Tensei. Mushoku Tensei, I think, light novel covers too. It, it's just so fucking different. As we it's cool know, though. Good and different in a good way. Children who were unfamiliar to him was the leading factor in why he decided it was time to visit one of the human kingdoms. It was a covert mission in which he was planning to discreetly investigate things all while disguised as a human. While Xi'an normally would have been the one to accompany him, Xi'an. her presence was a bit too overt for the discreet type of mission Rimuru was going for. Yeah, we need a Diablo I mean, here, when bro. When she had tried to conceal her aura in an attempt to prove that she could do it, she instead just ended up making it bigger. <laughs> Shuna was, of course, the next. <laughs> what the fuck? She just created like a Kamehameha when we're supposed to, you know, suppress the mana. Shuna was, of course, the next best candidate after Xi'an. But her proficiency with the analysis skill made her one of the only people capable of keeping tabs on any potential threats to Tempest. These shitty Remember, fucking isekais! With the demon lords now being aware of Rimuru's existence, there was no telling when one of them might try to stir up a bit of trouble. Kalaman. So, in the end, the group to travel with Rimuru was going to be Ranga, one of Soei's body doubles, and a select group of guides that Rimuru had chosen beforehand. The Idiot Trio, aka the Elven Princess and her bodyguards. This group of guides wasn't yet aware of the job that awaited them, but it just so I love happened them. that great. these three exact adventurers were currently looking for a way to pay Rimuru back. They're actually so important in the context of the plot, like our story, because they were there for Shizu. They were straight up fucking there for Shizu, man. And like, they even like mourned after her like passing, right? Like, they were all there, and I think that's one of the most like critical points of the story, like Rimuru obtaining like Shizu's body and like becoming one together. As they were now, Ellen, Cabal, and Guido felt that they owed Rimuru an insurmountable debt. Cabal and Not Guido? Not only did he slay numerous monsters that posed a threat to their kingdom, but he was also the sole reason why the three of them were able to be promoted to B-rank adventurers. What? You Let's see, go? Whenever the three of them would arrive at the city of Tempest, there was all- I thought it's Eden with an R. Is it actually L with an- like Ellen? Is it actually Ellen? I thought it was Eden. But the Japanese way, of course, they're going to pronounce the R as an L. 
That makes a lot more sense. Sorry, L as an R. Always a surplus of materials and resources that Rimuru would give them for free. These horns, fangs, ears. That's right. She gave us the plot of Cabal Demon Lord. The others had true Demon Lord seed. It would show to the guild that they had slain monsters that threatened the nearby towns and villages. They weren't really materials that could be sold for money, but they did grant the three of them points. Points which would then be used to upgrade their ranks. Oh, you need points. It was system? a method of cheating the system that allowed them to climb the ranks far faster than anyone before. And even though something like this normally wouldn't be allowed, the guilt master Fuse decided to make an exception. <laughs> Fuck it, let's Despite climb. Despite being well aware of what Cabal and the others were doing, their connection with Rimuru was simply far too important to risk compromising. So they got power leveled by Rimuru and then Fuse was like, Fuck it, fine. Was this the time where Fuse already showed up and enjoyed our hot spring? I think he has. Because like, wasn't Fuse coming here to check us out? Because he's like, who are these? Tempest people. And then he's like, oh, it's just so great. I'm gonna just chill at the fucking hot springs and just eat gyoza and have fun and drink sake. And so after, so we pretty much just bribed him entirely. So as long as the three of them continued their training in Tempest, as well as showed restraint when it came to turning in resources, the arrangement they'd stumbled upon could continue as usual. <laughs> that said, this animation, this eating animation is so fucking good. It reminds me, it reminds me of the most recent Tensor episode, which is Hinata and her gang going to the ramen shop and eating gyoza and ramen, bro. Stumbled upon could continue as usual. <laughs> that said, the group didn't want to just they must be so starved. to Tempest only to take whatever materials they could. They truly wanted to be of help to Rimuru. So, when Gobita showed up and requested Gobita. their help in Rimuru's Hello. Name, the three of them were ecstatic to finally be able to repay what they owed. Now, the reason a guide was even needed in the first place was because no formal route actually Yo. existed between Tempest and Blumend. There were three highways currently under construction, but the ones to the Dwarven Kingdom and Eurasania were closer to completion than the one to Blumend. So, as it was now, a one-way trip to Blumend could take anywhere from two to four weeks by foot. Holy Over a fuck. third of the route was unpaved forest paths that could prove Thank God we could just teleport now. To be quite daunting. That's why someone like Cabal, who was supposedly familiar with where to go, was needed as a guide. Cabal's a guide? Anyways, okay. The initial half of the journey was tri I really don't know anything of the two dudes around Eren. I know that the leader is like super heroic and was willing to sacrifice himself against the battle against Ifrit. That gave me a lot of points, but like, I know nothing about Cabal and Guido. What a fucking name. Cabal and Guido, and just Eden. Traversed by wolf pulled carriage. Since parts of the highway had already been completed, Ranga's body doubles a I'm getting triggered. I'm getting fucking triggered looking at this fucking- what the fuck, dude. Looking at this road reminds me of all the fucking meetings, bro. Whenever I see Tensor right now, and if I see like a, like a table, if I see a table of people sitting around the table, I'm just like, OH! NO! NO! DON'T DO THIS! We're going to meeting mode! I found a newfound fucking trigger for me, dude. Watching Tensor, if I see a goddamn table, I'm like, oh! Ranga's body doubles allowed the group to speed through the first hundred miles in only a couple of days. Go, Bazo, let's go! Had the highway been finished, though, then the group could have easily completed the rest of the 200-mile route by the next day. That was the three-day journey that Rimuru was hoping to provide by completing this highway. He was attempting to create an invaluable piece of infrastructure Train. for kingdoms and passing merchants. I was talking about that last episode! Fuck! Dude, we need to get a train! Imagine how fast a transport of goods could be! All of which would funnel them directly through the city of Tempest. Now, As a main trading hub, yeah. Parts of the road had ended, it was now time for Cabal and the others to guide Rimuru through the forest. At first, the trio looked like experts as they traversed the train as if they'd done it hundreds of times before. But after three hours passed with the group starting to look increasingly nervous, Rimuru began to notice that the route was starting to look a bit familiar. Hmm? As it turns out, they'd actually been lost the entire time. <laughs> of course they didn't- You're supposed to be fucking guards. You're supposed to be fucking- Look at them! They're like, oh shit! I don't even know where I am anymore! Of course they didn't want to admit it since they were trying to seem reliable. But as soon as Rimuru opened up a map in his mind, he immediately saw that they'd been going in circles. They were only an hour away from where the highway was. The fuck do we need them for? So, with the day pretty much over now, Rimuru decided it was best to spend the night at the camp where Geld and his construction workers were living. All right. That way they could get a nice meal, then rest up and leave in the morning. 
Thank you, Gild and crew. While this certainly wasn't the impression that these three were trying to leave behind, it actually wasn't entirely their fault. You could honestly blame Rimuru more than you could blame anyone else. Really? Reason Why? Reason being that the point where they were in the forest was currently surrounded by Baffledils. What? This was a phantom- Ah, uh, of course, the Baffledils. I remember the Baffledils. The flower that caused those close to it to experience hallucinations. Okay, okay, Gelt okay. did know that they were there, but because he assumed Rimuru- Eden and the idiot trio got bodied by a bunch of flowers. Rimuru couldn't possibly get lost with his magic sense. He decided not to let them know before they had left. Had Rimuru actually been the one doing the guiding, then this definitely would have been a reasonable assumption to make. But because he was so caught up in taking part in this authentic adventure experience, Rimuru had turned off all his cheat-like abilities. Instead, he simply placed all his faith into the people who were guiding him. That <laughs> Bro wanted like the actual real experience, so decided to turn off his godlike abilities and just let these idiots fucking take him. And that's what you get. You're gonna get a real-life experience of getting stuck. That's how they had succumbed to the effects of the flower without him even knowing. Since this was a mistake that Rimuru wasn't planning on making a second time, the next day he decided to provide some help of his own. Kairibudis. He figured the best option would be to use Gluttony to clear the path in front of them. Not only would this prevent them from being inconvenienced by anything else, but it would also help <laughs> It's kind of fucked up. Just, just destroying trees like that, forest, bro? Because you got fucking tired of traveling? Just, 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 I don't know, man. You, you, you do this shit in real life. That's like, it's fucking illegal, right? That's like a crime. You can't just fucking cut down, just destroy trees like that. But hey, who gives a fuck in this world? Gelden opening up room for the highway, thus accelerating the project's completion. So with that setting everything back on track, Rimuru would spend the next week walking through the forest without much of an issue. There was plenty of food to keep everyone going, and the wolf wagon from Rimuru's stomach was the perfect place to sleep whenever nighttime came. It was such a... They didn't actually sleep in his stomach, right? The wagon was stored in the stomach and it got ported out. But imagine, like, Rimuru, like, eating the idiot trio and then them, like, going into the wagon in his stomach. No, how the fuck would that work? Relaxing change in pace that, by the time the journey was coming to its end, Ellen couldn't help but express her love for it. At this point, she wanted nothing more than to keep adventuring with Rimuru Oh, As fun as Rimuru knew that could have been, he also knew that it was impossible given how much responsibility he now bears. He did ponder the thought That's that sad. perhaps one day it could actually be possible. Oh, it's like friends that could have been, but I'm sorry. We gotta fucking be, I don't know, do more important shit like fucking raise a fucking nation. But that was a day that would only come when he was no longer needed. A day he was certain was such a long time away that it was likely Ellen and the others would already be dead by then. That's some freedom shit. What the fuck? What the fuck? Why are you giving me this existential crisis? When the thought of him outliving these humans had crossed his mind, what came after was the notion that perhaps this was how Milam felt. You're my only friend. Aww. Aww. Hey, at least we have met him until the end of the fucking world. Perhaps the reason why she's so reluctant to call anyone friend in the first place was actually because she didn't want to get left behind by them. The backstory. It was an idea that made Rimuru wonder something that he'd never really thought about before. That backstory went if hard. If making a close friend only meant that they were eventually going to die, then would it not be better to simply choose loneliness instead? No. And that's the mental trap that a lot of people get into. This is the um, common outcome of any edgy kid that experiences loss of a friend or some kind of relationship, right? And then what do they do? They start to question, why was I hurt from the first place? Well, the root cause is because I got dependent in other people. By forming these relationships, I've opened myself up to get hurt. And if I never open myself up, then I can never get hurt. This is the I'm 14 and deep kind of mindset that I too kind of upheld for like until I don't even fucking know how long. I feel like I still do it to a certain degree, but that's such a coward way of living. Think of it like this. You have this one shot at this thing called life. And in this brief moment, we should experience everything that we can, even if it means that being hurt on the long way. You can only be happy because you can feel sadness. But if you can't feel sadness or happiness, you're in just in this middle, wasting your life because you're being a coward, hiding in a shell, afraid to open up yourself to different experiences. I think that you should. Remember, it's like life is like this. You don't want to just go like this. That'll just be even more depressing. You got to get the highs or as highs as the lows or as lows. Dead? Well, that was a question in which he knew only time could answer. A question that Mila must surely already know the answer to. 
I can't even imagine Mirim even talking about a topic like this because she's just so seemingly immature, but maybe she does that intentionally and super and, and secretly she, she's like super deep. Anyway, it's after Rimuru had finally arrived at Blumund that we're given a little more information on the country itself. In terms of size, Blumund wasn't actually- Damn, look at all this shit. You got the Eastern Empire. Man, the Eastern Empire is actually so close. The Forest of Jura, this is where we are, the Sealed Cave. And the Jura Tempest, we, like, this is like beyond the water. No, 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 no. Yeah! No, it was that. There was like a world expanding scene. It wasn't just in Skimichi Moon Fantasy, right? Where the Demiplane was like, yo, there's some Wakasam, there's some stuff beyond the Demiplane. It said like beyond this lake, there's like a bees and shit, right? I, I, I remember that, right? So this must be like besides like the Eastern Empire, right? Because if we're in the Sealed Cave, because, like, we've also been to, like, Kleeman's Domain, right? Yeah, Rubedius is so far away. I don't know what barren lands really mean here. Also, what's even more cool, like, yeah, this is our continent, right? We have Ingresia, you know, Pharmas, Western Nations, blah, blah, blah. We have all this shit. But, like, what about beyond this? Like, because there's other lands. Like, we need to cross the ocean. What lies beyond? Because, like, you have this map. Imagine you zoom out. And this is just one simple one continent out of like many different continents. And like our continent's like smaller than those other continents. The scale would expand so much. It will be so fucking hype. Actually very big. It was a much smaller kingdom consisting of numerous little villages as well as only one big settlement of the capital. Plus with less than a million people making up the total population. Blumund really was very tiny in comparison to the other countries. The main city at the capital was about as generic of a fantasy setting as you could think of. Not only did the buildings give off that medieval European kind of vibe, Monstad, but pretty basically. much every person walking the street was armed with weapons and armor. Monstad from Genshin Impact. A key difference between here and Dwargan though was that the quality of people are tall. Everyone's gear here was significantly poorer. <laughs> there was a very distinguishable difference Kaijin. in quality between the work of Dwarven artisans and pretty much everyone else. That's some racist shit, bro. I keep saying this. Like, what? Just because they're dwarves, you think they got fucking good artisanship? You think they're good at crafting, bro? You think all Asians are fucking good at, you know, math? A little bit of racism, I say, bro. So, despite many people looking armed and ready to fight, not many looked very capable of fighting at all. Another deceiving factor about the city was its level of advancement. What Rimuru initially believed to be medieval through and through was actually a bit more high-tech than he'd imagined. It was definitely a different path from the society he knew on Earth. But magic had clearly assisted in the development of their civilization beyond what he thought they were capable of. Had monsters and demon lords not been something for humans to worry about, then Rimuru believed that this type of civilization could have become far more advanced far more quickly. It just so happened- Monsters and demons are holding civilization back from technology? ...happened that the extremely harsh nature of the world itself was a direct hindrance to the progress of society. Really? That said- Is that- what Luminism based their entire philosophy on? Or religion on? Because like that is like an actual good talking point. Human civilization could be so much more advanced if it was not for these goddamn monsters. Therefore, we need to call these monsters in the name of Luminism and humans. That actually does make sense. Rimuru knew all too well just how limitless the human desire could be. So even though the human kingdoms would set aside land for the demon lords to rule on their own, it wasn't a sure Why is thing the that soundtrack that so beautiful right now? Forever. Sure, the power difference between monsters and humans may be enough to keep them from expanding their territories for now. But there was no telling how long that difference in power would actually remain. Because of this uncertainty, Rimuru knew there was always the possibility that one kingdom could become greedy enough to invade another. It was mm. a possibility that he was Foul planning muse. to discuss upon his return to Tempest. For now though, Rimuru's current mission was to head to the office of the guild. His plan was to meet up with Fuse, then get him to write an invitation to see Grandmaster Yuki. So that we can get fucking backstabbed by this motherfucker. But once the group had arrived, there were a few adventurer-related activities that Rimuru needed to take care of first. Specifically his registration. This was a matter that was typically handled by the General Affairs Department. What, did, what do you do? You put your hand over a magic ball that appraises you based on what kind of stats or skills you have, and then it's gonna break and- Oh my god! Ari and I, you cannot be an SSS rank adventurer! It was a section of the guild where beginners could join, leave, or ask any basic questions. Next to that, there were also counters that indicated designated areas for sales or experts. Sales, as you'd expect, was where all quest-related materials were processed. Phantom flowers? Are, those are the flowers that fucked us up on the way here, right? So Eden basically collected a bunch of the flowers that give us hallucinations and then we're just profiting off of it. 
then the expert's department was an area exclusive Bald. only to adventurers accredited by the guild. These were members of the organization who typically took part in out-of-town activities such as retrieval, exploration, or monster slaying. If you wanted to be an official adventurer, then you had to be recognized by the guild as being proficient in one of these three categories. Anything else meant that you weren't really an adventurer. <laughs> so, so you need to be good at at least one of these. Okay, retrieval, monster slaying, exploration. Yeah, sounds about right. Exploration, just like, you know, adventuring, retrieval, getting shit back home, monster slaying, killing monsters, okay, yeah. Anything else meant that you weren't really an adventurer. So, you could very well be the most skilled mage in the entire capital. Overlord but spoilers. Unless you had infield experience with retrieval, Overlord spoilers. Slaying, the guild wouldn't give you the adventurer to- Overlord spoilers! For the trio of Cabal, Ellen, and Guido, they were each B-rank adventurers proficient. Anies really loves Overlord, bro. Every fucking... It's not really spoilers. I'm just joking around. It doesn't really matter, right? But, like, Anies loves using Overlord in his videos. ...in their own individual departments. That way, their duties could be split much more evenly. Not only did this mean that each of them was an expert in the eyes of the guild, but it also granted them a lot more freedoms when it came to travel. You see, anyone who carried the title of adventurer was allowed to change their nationality and country of residence anytime they wanted. What? It was a privilege that bypassed immigration laws and made crossing borders that much easier. That's fucking cracked, but I, I guess to most people that sounds kind of boring, but in, in real life, like, what? That's crazy. Something Rimuru knew he would need if he was going to make it to the kingdom of Ingracia. So, when he walked up to the general affairs desk to register as an adventurer, the clerk as well as several bystanders looked at him with a bit of confusion. Why? I mean, to them, Rimuru did just look like this little kid. It was only natural they misjudged oh, okay, his ability okay. because of his youthful appearance. Fortunately for Rimuru, though, Cabal's reputation as an elite adventurer went to subside some of that skepticism. Cabal's reputation as an elite adventurer. <laughs> Cabal and elite adventure. Because, like, I see them as idiots. But, like, to the human realm, Cabal is, like, he is him. Elite adventurer. His reputation supersedes any of the uh, suspicion they have on Rimuru just being a kid. Like, what the fuck? Hold up. Hold up. Hold, hold up. Cabal, Guido, and Eren could be just like the legendary adventure group that we think are nothing because we keep comparing them to godlike figures in this world. Not everyone believed it when he said that this kid could take all of them on at once, but just the fact that it was coming from Cabal was enough to make them think that it could be. Damn! It was a statement that worked to grant Rimuru permission to take the test. As for what this test entailed, well, each was different depending on the department that the candidate was going for. Explorers were required to thoroughly investigate man-made ruins and report their findings. Retrievers were sent into the forest to find and bring back a specific item. Then, monster slayers were given a set of increasingly difficult- Yeah, we gotta be monster to slaying, right? Of course- ...specific item. Then, monster slayers were given a set of increasingly difficult monsters to fight in. <laughs> you think I missed that? I'm always locked in, bro. Kill. Of course, Rimuru could easily do all three, but because the monster slaying test could be taken immediately, that's the one that he decided to go for. Alright. Now, the moment he declared that this was his intent, both the clerk and nearby adventurers were shocked by this seemingly hasty no decision. No way! Monster I mean, slaying! This test wasn't it's the hardest! He could simply take and walk away unscathed from. And that's because a minimum ranking of D was required to complete it. The way these ranks worked in the guild was much like how it worked. Fed the kabas piasses. Fed the kabas piasses. Fed sibasibasis. What is the SP here? It's like after A, that's like special A. Then there's S, and then there's special S class. In many other systems, every new adventurer had to start off at the lowest rank of F. Then from there, they could only take jobs that were the same rank or one rank higher. As soon as some actual experience has been gained, that's when the guild can choose to promote you to the next rank. Cool. It was a system designed by Yuki himself in order to prevent accidents and- The rat Yuki! So when it came to monster slaying, it's funny how in this show, the guildmaster decided to make a system to keep the adventurers safe, but in Skimichi Moonlit Fantasy, the guildmaster Lou created a system that's intense, like intentionally trying to cull the human population by using their ambitions and greed. It's, <laughs> and both shows are kind of, like, Tensura takes inspiration from Skimichi, but yeah. 
Both the jobs as well as the test that Rimuru was about to take was limited by the ranking he was currently assigned. That said, the test did also provide the opportunity to quickly improve said rank. Reason being that, for each monster Rimuru successfully beat, not only would his rank go up to the next level, but he would also be given the option to immediately take the test for the next rank after. That's why it was pretty much a consecutive sequence of increasingly difficult battles. Should he fail while fighting one of the higher ranked monsters, Sounds though, like a then gauntlet, as bro. his rank would be demoted. Some kind of like boss rush gauntlet mode in the so game. examiners wouldn't constantly be bothered by adventurers who only sought to increase their ranks. But anyway, due to the earlier commotion caused at the general affairs desk, a summoner type examiner was already on site to see for himself whether Cabal's words were true or not. Oh, someone he doubts him? didn't believe that. Thegus. We've never seen this character beyond this, you know, OVA light novel only stuff, right? Rimuru was as strong as Cabal was making him out to be. So he was very eager to test Rimuru's skills with a set of monsters from his own personal arsenal. The first monster he summoned was a low level hunter hound that met its end as. No, as not his poor dog! With a single slash, Rimuru had no! beheaded the opponent in front of him, thus granting him the rank of E as well as silencing the Why I gotta the kill a dog, process. man? While Thegis wasn't really impressed, he did become a tad upset. <laughs> the idiot were just celebrating over the death of a dog, and he's like, Huh? Set when Rimuru joked about wanting to skip to the A rank test. It made it seem as if he was wasn't looking a down joke, on though. everyone else. So, despite the next test being for the D rank, the monster Thegis had summoned would have been. <laughs> Gopta? <laughs> what is this? They summoned Gopta, dude? Challenging even for a C rank. It was a fully armored dark goblin that many recognized as his primary servant. Oh my god! An opponent that surely didn't fit the rank that it was being tested for. But just like how it was with the hunter Easy. Hound, so too did Thegis' <laughs> go-to summon meet its end <laughs> Head tossed off. Oh no! About we need to heal this goblin, I feel bad! With an immediate decapitation. Once again stunning both the examiner <laughs> and every person watching. His reactions, bro. <laughs> Thegis' reactions to all his summons getting just one shot, dude. <laughs> a group of giant bats. Yeah, like the the first half of, you know, obviously the adventuring stuff getting lost and stuff like that might be a little boring to people, but I think that the actual exam itself, the adventure exam, him going through a gauntlet like Bosch Rush style, it would be very fun to watch, huh? Were then summoned for the C rank test. Thegis hoped that by having multiple enemies attack from different directions, then perhaps this would be a bit more challenging than all the other tests. But because Rimuru's perception speed was already so high, the bats didn't even look as if they were moving. One by one, they were struck down with yet another single slash from his blade, Megido. making it painfully clear to a very frustrated Thegis that one of his strongest summons was definitely going to be needed here. What so, is it? With quite a bit of effort. What's the strongest? Part, Thegis proceeded to complete the ritual to summon a lesser demon. Oh, a lesser demon. Had come across a creature such as this, but it was also the first time that he'd witnessed the summon demon spell. And this is where he learns. Got it. See, this is very important because we learn how to summon off of this guy. Mm. It was a completely different type of magic from the one used to summon the monsters he was fighting before. A type of magic that was practically gifted to him on a silver platter. You see, just like how it was with most other magic, all it took was one glance at the spell's activation for Rimuru to make it his own. So, if you'd ever wondered where Rimuru had learned- That's still the funniest scene. Diablo summoning is so funny because Rimuru looks like he's just like a sleeping like um, iPad. Uh, like an eye mask on Ranga and Ranga just smiling. Something about this is hilarious. ...where Rimuru had learned how to summon demons like Beretta or Diablo. Well, this was where it all began. Getting- Thegis is the reason that we have Diablo. Kinda crazy. Back to the test now. This lesser demon certainly wasn't a monster suitable to give someone who was trying to climb to the B rank. It was pretty clear that Thegis was just trying to give Rimuru as difficult a task as he could. I mean, the one shot it. down his face was evidence enough to indicate all the magical one shot it. he'd put into it. What made <laughs> this opponent so much more difficult than all the others though was the fact that it was impervious to any sort of physical attack. Because creatures like this possessed spiritual bodies consisting mostly of magicules, that meant they couldn't be affected by physical damage of any kind. Use spiritual that attacks. The, case, the optimal attack here was most definitely gluttony. If Rimuru had opened up with that, then this fight would have ended just as quickly as all the others. It just swallows but everything. It's no black hole. It's too OP. Rimuru wanted to absorb this demon, to do so now would attract way too much attention. So as Rimuru dodged the demon while considering so no gluttony. Next, 
he remembered that magic was simply the embodiment of whatever he pictured in his mind. He then recalled that his art of model will was a special technique that allowed him to convert his aura into offensive power. As he went on to consider exactly how these two functioned, Rimuru believed he could use both together to create a magic aura. Okay. So by taking Model Will's offensive power then applying magic kills to it, Rimuru was able to create pure magical energy. It that was a hurts a demon. Skill that allowed him to attack with magical force instead of physical force. Okay. All he had to do after producing it was simply apply the energy to his sword as if he was wrapping it in paper. Imbuing the sword. Was a usable weapon that could deal damage to spiritual enemies. The effects of which were very evident after only a single strike was needed to defeat the weapon. <laughs> thus granting Rimuru the title of a sick. B rank adventurer. Only B rank though. But yeah, that's the story behind how Rimuru became an adventurer. Of course, there's still a bit more to cover regarding this arc, but that's something to talk about in another video. Oh, there's even more? Now, if you enjoyed this type of content, then be sure to subscribe since I'll be focusing on- Y'all know what to do. Go to Mr. Any News' channel. Go like his videos and sub to his channel. This is obviously not the most exciting cut content from Rimuru's stuff, but it is important in summoning, right? So the summoning of the demons, this is kind of where we kind of, kind of got the inspiration. From, right and then beretta too right diablo this is actually pretty important so that's it next we'll probably be watching uh, <coughs> you guys can't really see this right now right next we'll probably be watching like how rimuru became a demon lord and stuff like that and there's still a lot more to go and that's it from me